Our presentation this evening is on why is there a light ship in Portsmouth, Virginia, and it promises to be an interesting and exciting topic for the evening. Before I introduce this speaker, allow me to take a moment to tell you about some upcoming programs that we will be hosting here at the museum. Our program for May 26, which is our annual May Day, May Memorial Day program, will be Come See History. It'll be take a back from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. after our continuous, um, the longest continuous parade in the United States. So I hope you'll come down for the parade also. The first uh, Saturday in June, on June the 7th, will be the Road, Rail, Steam, and Sail. Um, and the first Saturday in July will be the annual pa Patriots Day event. Um, it will be July the 5th this year. So um, for additional details, please visit the website Portsmouth Naval History Museum. Shipyard Museum. Shipyard Museum, okay. I don't do that. I don't do computers that well, so I cannot vouch for the, for the website. I, can't, I don't even know whether it's accurate or not, but I trust that Corey keeps it up to date. It's accurate. <laughs> this evening we have as our speaker Corey Thornton, who has served as the Curator of History for the Portsmouth Museum since 2007. <clears throat> Specifically, his duties include overseeing all aspects of the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard Museum and the Lightship Portsmouth Museum, including facilities management, collection management, research, programs, events, volunteer co coordinating. A lifelong resident of Norfolk, Virginia, he earned his AS degree in education from Tidewater Community College in 1998. He's just a baby, isn't he? And a BA in 2000 and an MA in 2006 in history from the Old Dominion University with a concentration in 19th century American history. He spends his personal time with his family and engaged in research on various aspects of American history with plans to publish in the future. At the conclusion of the presentation this evening, Corey will be available to answer any questions you may have about his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Corey, who is our featured guest this evening. Becky? All right. I'm all tangled up in this. That's okay. <clears throat> I was telling Becky that uh, usually I do that and I introduce, but it'd be a little strange doing it for myself this evening. So thank you, Becky, once again for that self serving statement that I wrote. <laughs> thank you for reading it. Um, I was thinking about a title <clears throat> of a uh, presentation that maybe gets to the heart of things that we see all the time, but we never really know fully why they're there. You see something, you see a little red ship, we'll say. And you might even have visited it and gotten the history of it, where it was on station, who served aboard. But some, no one, I, at least I was wondering, well, sometimes I look at things and said, I just ask why. So I said, you know, why is there a light ship in Portsmouth, Virginia? So I'll just start with the main data point. Uh, one of the main data points that we relay to our visitors, there never actually was a Portsmouth station. It's just good marketing on our part. So when you see Portsmouth written on the side, we're actually the only light ship with that pseudonym for the city in which it's in. But it really continues the tradition of naming ships for the state, the light ships for the stations that uh, where they were serving. So it has a historical uh, purpose. <coughs> so with this in mind, We'll ask, why is there a, a light ship in Portsmouth, Virginia? Well, first we'll start with our mission statement. The light ship Portsmouth tells the story of those who served in the light ship service, their dedication to life aboard the vessel and service of the navigation of mariners through preservation, educational programs, 
and uh, e exhibition of the lightship. A few facts, and <clears throat> well, our lightship is obviously the, the main point of, of the presentation this evening, but it'll, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of go over to a, a, a tangent in a way of, of the history of our ship, again, why it's here. So every single slide may not necessarily feature our light ship, but you'll get the point, I think. <laughs> so the specifications, here you see a few specifications of the ship, what we typically talk about to the public. I, I, I won't read each and every one of them. Um, we do have some handouts that we'll have up at the desk you're welcome to take uh, before the end of the evening. But this was a... A, it was somewhat cutting edge at its time. It was built in 1915, finished, and uh, commissioned in 1916. Our ship was. Uh, cost was $108,000. Excuse me, $108,507. 101 feet in length. Uh, its draft, which is the uh, water line to the keel, is 11 feet. Tonnage, three, 360. Uh, this was a whaleback design hull. That's the, the type of um, construction that, that the, uh, the ship is. And it was built with a rounded design um, so that the water would easily wash over in those high seas and you know, bad storms and such. Uh, the beacon was powered by kerosene. Then it was acetylene gas for a little while. And finally, it uh, was upgraded to electric power, which we still have today. Fog signal was a six inch air siren, mushroom type horn. and and so on. Again, just some, a few facts there that, uh, again, a handout could do a, probably a, do a better job of me than running through them in a robotic fashion. So we talk about uh, its service real quickly. 1916 to 1939, it was part of the Lighthouse Service, um, which was the United States Lighthouse Service, and, and which isn't around today because it was actually absorbed into the Coast Guard back in 1939. But before that, it was on station at Cape Charles, so its name was Charles. In 1925 to 26, it really wasn't used, and guess what? It was actually right down the river during that time, but more about that later. And uh, 26 to 51, it was the Overfalls. So that was its life, a little bit of overlap there with the, uh, as, uh, the Overfalls from the Lighthouse Service to the, to the Coast Guard. Uh, but again, in, in 1939, part of the legislation at that time was that the Lighthouse Service and all the aids to navigation became part of the, the Coast Guard and has been ever since. So it really has had two lives, is the way I like to think about it. The other was with the Coast Guard. So here, uh, again, 39 to 64, and that's a total of 48 years, by the way, that, that, that the ship actually served as a light ship. Again, overfalls from 1926 to 51, and that was up, by the way, in Delaware Bay. In 1951 to 63, it was at Stone Horse Shoal in the Nantucket Sound, and it was designated Stone Horse. Somewhere in there, it was also a relief ship for the Nantucket Station, which was just a little bit uh, over a ways from its station as Stone Horse. And these names are, there's a lot of funny names out there for light ships. But they usually shorten them, and they, they each have a story in and of themselves. So you, see, you hear some interesting names, um, and you'll hear a few this evening, too. <clears throat> 1963, it was on Cross Rip Shoal, also in the Nantucket Sound, and its name was Cross Rip. It's the cat. What's that? <laughs> Captain Pete. So there it is, it's the Charles. That's uh, one of its personalities, if you will. That's its first... Um, the first uh, station that it was on. And as the Charles, it served off of Cape Charles. Lightships were typically named, as I said, on the, for the stations on which they were serving. Um, and actually, Cape Charles was grouped under the, the Lighthouse Service's 5th District. If that sounds familiar, it, it should, it, as it's uh, very much in line with the Coast Guard's 5th District of today. 5th District headquarters, for instance, is right, next, right across the street. They're our neighbors. Um, it was at that time that our light ship would have been supplied and serviced here in Portsmouth at the Lighthouse Service Buoy Depot, just uh, about a half a mile down the water line from here. From 24 to 25, or that is from 25 to 26, as I said earlier, it was in storage and it wasn't used. And it was at that time that it was essentially berthed right near the Intellos Pavilion where it is today. But I'll, I'll come back to that a little later. So here we see it as the Overfalls. <coughs> And um, 
This again was from 1926 to 1951. It was at that time that the ship transitioned again over to the Coast Guard. So you have both flags that it would have flown during its, uh, its tenure, Lighthouse Service, Coast Guard. And there it is, a stone horse, its uh, last station. And so um, <clears throat> while en route to Boston, while it was the stone horse, it, it was en route to Boston for repairs. They'd just put these ships out on station and they'd leave them out there and they, they wouldn't move them unless they had to because mariners counted on them being there. So you really didn't move them. And when you did, you put a ship out there that said relief. So um, while it was coming in to get some repairs, it actually broke down and it must have been a serious enough breakdown that it was ultimately decided to decommission, take the ship out of service. So now we move into its retirement and rebirth. Um, Shortly uh, after it was taken out of service, a, a local mover and shaker here in the community, Mr. Frank Kirby, who was then chairman of the Public uh, and Business Affairs Committee of the Portsmouth Chamber of Commerce, um, he had an idea. The efforts were already underway to revitalize the entire area here of Old Town. Um, <laughs> and what Mr. Kirby did was he, he was looking for something like everyone else to really kind of draw people in. And this was also at a time when you're starting to get this national effort to preserve historic vessels. And I, uh, the, Mister, uh, the Missouri comes most direct to mind but, uh, at Pearl Harbor. But you start seeing this effort really picking up. And I think he put two and two together. And he was a, a native and a lifelong resident, World War II veteran um, here in the city and recalled seeing light ships in his youth on the Elizabeth River in the days, you know, uh, that is in the earlier days, again, of his youth. So <laughs> why, why were these ships on the river? Why were they up coming and going? When normally light ships are just put out there and left there, as I said. They, they were frequently kept at the buoy depot yard, which I keep pointing this way, but I'll get to that in, in a few minutes. It was down that way. Uh, that's where they kept them. Now, even though it was a buoy depot yard, Keep in mind, these things are very stationary, and I always say it's, it sounds a little more romantic to call it a floating lighthouse than a very um, large buoy, especially if you go inside and see that it has a, a historic house type of, an, uh, an unconventional historic house, but I think a historic house all the same. It has that, that interior. <laughs> so um, I'll defer to kind of the full story of everything that we have in our exhibit over here about the lightship. But Mr. Kirby, remembering light ships as a, as a child, thought, you know, we should get a light ship. It's something that was frequent along the river. Um, at that time, he probably came and went, both um, at the, the lighthouse du buoy depot. Uh, and at that time, I understand that the, the, the shipyard, the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, was something that you could go see like an attraction pretty, pretty, pretty easily, unlike today, which is understandable. <laughs> So it was through Mr. Kirby's efforts, and he worked with other um, folks in the community, and uh, got the light ship brought here to Portsmouth. Again, we talk about its story in the exhibit. And ultimately, they converted it into the museum that we have today. The rest, as they say, is history. And uh, here you see the ship on opening day, 1967. That's uh, a parking space I really wish I had right now parking lot at all, actually. So, um, our mission statement, again, is, as you know, we told, said earlier, to focus in on part of it. The lightship tells the story of those who served in the lightship service, their dedication to life aboard the vessel, and service to the navigation of mariners. So, again, you know, certainly there are other many facets to discuss regarding the lightship's history, but but in the interest of time, you know, let's go to the bigger question. Why is there a light ship here in Portsmouth? So let's step back and look at kind of the, uh, a few quotes I throw in here and there and uh, about light ship sailor's life. Uh, and, and if we're focusing on them as part of our mission statement, it's important to understand, uh, I think Captain Pete here would agree, and I'll, I'll highlight you a little bit later, my friend. You're, you're one of my, uh, my uh, uh, what do they call those? Uh, yeah, well. hands-on learning devices, or for lack of a better term. Anyway, uh, again, the mission statement is, is the dedication of the lightship sailors aboard. You really had to be dedicated. 
to be on a light ship, to serve a, aboard a light ship. Um, it wasn't fun, it wasn't fascinating, romantic, or adventurous pretty much in any way. It seems to be the overall trend after you look at these quotes, so look at them. Day after day, month after month, year after year, they live out there unvarying routine and no way disturbed by the clamorous den of politics, the dirt, and the dust of the city, and the humdrum of trade. It's fairly enlightening. It's a dreary, lonesome existence at best, like the Board of Lightship, within sight and almost within hearing of a coast that teems with life and human interest, where something important is happening almost every hour of every day. And to be ignorant of it for days at a time as though you were living on the moon. Well, that really teases the lightship sailor, I think, when he read that in the, uh, the article in the New York Times of 1903. So it's kind of like, see, we're doing a lot here, and you're out on the lightship. Uh, must have been interesting reading for them. And uh, the one I, I, I like the best is, it was like you were in jail, excuse the typo, for 30 days or longer. And that was in 1951 to 1953. So, again, not a glamorous life, but, but one that was uh, that definitely uh, provided service for, for all the mariners coming in and out of the country along the coasts. So, meet Frank Womble, lightship sailor. At the beginning of his lightship service circa 1930, this is what he looked like. This is slightly before the, the Coast Guard would take on the, uh, the lightship service. They would inherit it, if you will. So, uh, at the end of his service, and I don't have the exact date, these, these photos were provided by the Coast Guard historian, our, our buddy next door here, Bill Thiessen. This is what Mr. Wommel here, I call him Frank, this is what he looked like afterward. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the stringent policies or regimentation of the lighthouse service uh, were a little relaxed at the time, I think you might agree. <laughs> he was my kind of sailor. <laughs> Uh, it sounds so great, but him and I share a certain fascination with it here. How about that? So, but the sailor's life, um, in fact, I pulled this scene and this quote um, from the same article I was talking about before that essentially convey the reality of the situation, and this is probably isn't exclusive of the 19th century. This feeling was shared by lightship sailors throughout the, the night, you know, up all through the 1960s. <laughs> Incidentally, this scene depicts the New South Shoal lightship in 1990. Later, this station would be renamed Stone Horse, which you may recognize, which uh, was a more familiar name that our ship served on. So, I definitely, uh, I have nightmares myself, I think, from serving such conditions. Um, and this is probably one of my all-time favorite quotes. If it weren't for the disgrace it would bring on my family, I'd rather go to state's prison. So uh, it really gives you a sense of, uh, of that grueling dedication that, this, uh, that, that, the, that these lightship sailors had. So a few more scenes, as you see here. Um, more scenes from the same article. Lightships not only provided a beacon of light for mariners, but also a beacon of sound through... Um, uh, the use of foghorns and the technology at the time, and uh, were capable of producing extremely loud, uh, loud sounds as a means of warning when visibility was low. So, being a light ship, that was their primary objective, to provide light. But they also would provide a beacon of sound. Here you see the light from a distance. Here you see it a little more up close, and here the gentleman's ringing the fog, the, uh, the fog bell, not too uh, different from the one that's currently at the ship that we, we have aboard. Another uh, little scene into the lightship sailor's life. Um, life saving. Though the primary objective, again, was to be a beacon of light and sound, um, and the objective was to stay on station to guide mariners in, it wasn't uncommon for the crew of lightships to actually assist with, uh, with rescues, even if it meant just providing a place to bring survivors to from a, a, a vessel that may be sinking. This is the scene of an old one. And uh, what we have here is while the care of lightships, or while the care of the lightship is considered su such importance to shipping that the crew are instructed not to expose themselves to dangers outside their special line of duty, and they would therefore have the fullest excuse for not risking their lives and rescuing others, they have never hesitated to do so. So even if it meant sending a boat, keeping a ship in place, sending a boat out to assist with the rescue of. Um, of people who uh, were, were in danger 
So they did it. And it wasn't really uncommon at all, whether it was the 1890, the 1890s, as you see here, or uh, a little later, in uh, 1956, with the sinking of the Andrea Doria, um, which was a passenger liner, I believe, um, LV-114 actually helped assist with the rescue of people from Andrea Doria, and I believe, it, again, it was as, as a station to bring them to, because in order to get them out of the uh, area of where the ship was sinking. So, um, scripted into breaking the monotony. Um, one of the things, and I think this, you know, I've, I've certainly read, you know, historic history. And what my interest has been through the Civil War, you know, the War of 1812, things of that nature, American history especially, but even with lightship history too. And, and you know, although they, they kind of weave in and out of, of our history since 1820, news is, and, and newspapers have always been a very sought after thing in, in the day before, before our smartphones and other modern technologies that bring us all of our news instantaneously. This uh, article. Uh, quote from this, the courtesy of delivering the papers to lightships is one which concerns only the keepers thereof, but as anything unusual is a relief for the monotony, to the monotony that is, of, of sea voyage, this courtesy is one which is frequently pack, uh, practiced. You see uh, a ship delivering, dropping off papers to the lightship, and they were, they were very thankful for, for anything that did break the monotony after you read account after account. Some of the things that they would do aboard and we see a few scenes from light ships here. Uh, just like life in general, life had its good moments aboard ships, whether it was having a hot cup of joe, which is called hot coffee here. It's got a lot of space on that ship though. I, I, I found that interesting. Anyway, and then, or you may have, you know, a little bit of uh, playing of cards, although I'm pretty sure this is a staged photo. Uh, no reason to believe it wasn't on a light ship or a ship in general, but, but there was a lot of this too. After you read the accounts, you see playing cards, reading, playing games of, of other sorts. Um, again, whatever you, you did in your off time, not that there was much of it, whatever you could do in your off time to kind of pass the time to do your service and know that eventually you won't be on light ships anymore, that's what it was all about. And that isn't to say that there weren't some, some guys that um, didn't enjoy the service. Uh, the funny thing is, and I think, um, uh, I found it interesting. When we had the Lightship Sailors reunion here in 2005, I had questionnaires and I was asking them all, you know, you know, uh, you know about life aboard. And the trend seemed to be that as far as being on a ship, how did you feel about it? The bachelors hated it. The married guys didn't mind it so much. So you do the, you do the math. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> The sailor's life, or perhaps uh, fishing, a major pastime, right, Pete? Oh, yeah. Okay. I keep, I keep referencing our friend P uh, Peter here, uh, because this is him, <laughs> commanding officer of the Nantucket. You see him here with a, with a catch. I'm sure he caught all of his own. Yeah. <laughs> all big lobsters. Yeah. And here you are preparing those. Here's another scene of uh, the guy's... Uh, caught quite a, I think it was a shark there, and um, fishing was a big pastime, and usually it's because many times you were probably, you know, eating it later. Well, probably maybe not all the time, but, you know, certainly fishing is past the time when they had time. So you, you had fishing as another way to break the monotony. You also had, you know, basically kind of posing in general. As you see here, uh, posing at the forepeak of the... Yeah, let's see which one this is. This would have been LV-92. And then you have a color photo here. And now when I say LV, I mean light vessel. It was the way they designated ships at the time. Uh, LV-92. Then you have um, other identified vessels here. But they, uh, they actually would, you know, take, take time out of their, their, their schedules there aboard the ship and maybe pose for a group picture. And you had a lot of camaraderie like you would in any kind of circumstances. Light ships were not known for being big. So uh, you developed routines very quickly on that, you know, I, I, would, I would say not having been aboard one, but, you know, really built morale. Your CEO would probably let things relax a little bit more, but I'll defer to the experts on that. 
Captain Pete. And then uh, these gentlemen are really getting some sun in over here, though. So, so amen to that. A lot of sun on Nantucket Shoals. A lot of, not a lot of sun on Nantucket Shoals. Well, there's a lot of sun on Savannah, and that's where this one's taking place. So, a little farther down south. <clears throat> some of the other concerns. These, these are actually not of the other concerns, but these are some major concerns that the, um, that, you know, the, the sailors had. So you had fog, ships passing too close, and rough weather. These are excerpts from uh, some of those questionnaires that I had taken back in 2005. Days and days of fog and the foghorn forever blasting away. Parting of anchor chain in bad weather. Being vulnerable to collisions from vessel traffic. Hurricanes in the summer. So in a sense, you, get, you really get them outlined, or that is, you get a sense of, of the major concerns being Bad weather, rough weather, fog, which is still part of weather, but um, there's kind of a distinguishing line there. And then you have collisions, which um, any of those factors can kind of overlap themselves if you, you know, especially with fog. You know, collisions were the, the biggest fret when you had a lot of fog. They're worried about a larger ship getting, uh, you know, essentially running right into you, which did happen. So concerns of the sailor fog. Heavy fog. When you heard the foghorn turned on, you knew there was a ship within three miles of the light ship, and everybody, it seems to me, everybody just real, real kind of like, you know, just kind of waiting and just being very nervous from what I can tell with the, with the accounts I've read. And it only takes one or two accounts that predate them to get around the word on the ship, which doesn't take too long, and uh, to know that collisions can be pretty bad, so, the, you know, it's not... It's not an unfounded worry. On that note, collision. And probably the most notable, although it certainly doesn't demean any of the other collisions, of course, but the most notable that we even talk about here is the, <coughs> the uh, collision. We're well, not even collision. Essentially, you have the, uh, sister of the sister ship of the Titanic called the Olympic essentially slicing a light ship in half. Um, on May 15, 1934, LV-17, the Nantucket that you see here, was struck by the passenger liner Olympic, again, sister ship to the Titanic. It was nearly 70 time, 75 times larger than the light ship and traveling at about 20 knots, which is a little above 20 miles per hour, okay. not about a mile per hour, which a mile and a Struck it broadside in heavy fog and drove it to the bottom. Boats from the Olympic were immediately put over, but the light ship sank within minutes, killing seven of the 11 crew members. Uh, so really, really, this was the one that really took a lot of lives. I mean, it was granted seven of 11, but uh, it, it really was big news at the time. And the, well, the interesting thing is you, hear, you see here at the bottom, this picture was actually purported to have been taken from the deck of the Nantucket, the same ship, only a few weeks before when the same ship was either, I think it was going, coming in or going out. But, um, I mean, that's how close it would come. So if you throw fog into the mix, what results is, uh, is the, the larger picture that you see there. What they did was hone in on the radio beat. And then they, if they didn't turn their course on time, so sp uh, spoken from, the, from a man who did this. And Pete will be available for questions and book signings after the, uh, the, uh, the, the lecture here, too. <laughs> Maybe not book signings yet, right, Peter? Um, so let me find which slide I'm on here. Okay, collision. On June 24th, 1960, the relief light ship LV-78 um, or its Coast Guard designation of WAL 505 serving on the Ambrose Station was struck by an ocean liner and uh, it was called the Queen Elizabeth. Here you see the crew after they had been rescued and basically uh, one of the crew members recounted that we all braced ourselves as we watched in horror the much taller bow of the freighter's first strike and splinter, the, life, the motor lifeboat, then strike our starboard side. So they watch this thing come in slowly and watch it just rip up their ship. Uh, to get back to the quote, directly afterwards, I did a quick head count of all hands on deck. All were okay with no injuries. We witnessed the U.S. Coast Guard light ship relief LV-78 WAL-505 WAL sink. 
and disappear beneath the waves approximately 10 minutes after the Green Bay collided with her. Green Bay, hmm. Yeah, it was the Green Bay that the ship hit here. Ah, okay, it's Green Bay, okay. And the captain, whatever, named Joe Young, mm -hmm. he was from this area. Oh, really? Yeah, and I knew him well, and he said the chief, the chief, the captain was off, the chief was running it. Mm -hmm. But he said this, the ship went down so fast that the chief was the last one to leave, and he stepped off the ship and stepped in the small boat. Wow. <laughs> right in the nick of time, I'd say. Other concerns of the sailor, bad weather. This photo was actually taken from our light ship, circa 1960 or so. You can see the ice flows all around the ship. Now it's not high seas from a storm, it's not hurricanes necessarily, but ice flows were, were, were nothing, to, uh, were nothing to, um, to wink at. I know, I watched Deadliest Catch. So anyway, that's a bad reference. But anyway, ice flows could, could have you literally dead in the water. And um, certainly it didn't make things any warmer out on station. And this would have been also in the Nantucket Sound. So they weren't uncommon at that time. <coughs> okay. So then we talk about more bad weathers or storm, uh, bad weather, storms. Um, this is a scene that I was looking at and um, I thought it really conveyed what life at sea during high seas was, was really all about. I mean, water's crashing over. These, are, these things would be unnerving for myself, especially, I guess, you become a sailor, you get used to things, you get used to the way life aboard is, but uh, first few weeks or months, I mean, this would be pretty unnerving for myself, I'm sure for a lot of folks, but um, I don't know. It, uh, they really, again, you really had to have something to, uh, to be out on these ships and, 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 and do your do your service. So, um, you may now have a better sense of, of those who served aboard, which we just talked about. And, and we salute them for their efforts to help guide mariners in, along our coasts. Um, so, considering that, let's turn our attention back to the question that, you know, of, the, of the presentation is, why is there a light ship in Portsmouth? You know, I really haven't answered that yet, but I'm going to. And the answer lies on this little old river that's just outside of our door. And it starts with the <clears throat> U.S. Lighthouse Service buoy yard in 1890. It actually was established in 1870. Um, the buoy yard is where a lot of buoys would be kept. And like I said before, light ships, because they were stationary vessels, they didn't move them unless they had to. And it started off with um, only a few acres, but over the years, the buoy yard, buoy yard would grow. Here's one of the earliest pictures that we have from 1902, and I love this picture myself. It shows an overall view of the buoy yard looking northwest, or looking basically from down the river a piece, looking upward. You know, uh, here's the river you see over here, and I believe this is a light ship that you see just down the way. Um, so we move on. Here's another more interior view. Again, another great, great uh, photograph. The United States, you know, buoy depot, and it was, this is the timber wharf. You see a lot of timber, hence the name. And that timber was used uh, primarily to make uh, spar buoys, which is not unlike those older, I always thought kind of liken them to the older, well, there have been so many different types of bobbers you may have used with fishing, but they were kind of, uh, an elongated piece of wood that stuck up and down and kind of bobbed this way, those type of bobbers. Um, spar buoys were essentially the same thing and you'd use a lot of timber to build those. In the distance you see a lighthouse tender, which would go out to the lighthouses, provide coal and everything to keep the light burning, and supplies and things of that nature um, to keep the, uh, those manning the lighthouse stations and lighthouses, uh, you know, keep them in supplies and materials that they needed. And this was right here in the city of Portsmouth. Here's a view from the river and uh, shows more buoys. These are starting to get more modern metal type of buoys. So this is circa 1930 that you see. It's looking from the river again, probably just outside of Norfolk Naval Shipyard on the river. And you're looking, the shipyard's pretty much over this way. So from this area over, 
is where the buoy depot is, is occupying. Here you see it from the river. And I like this one because actually it's one of the photographs in our collection. That's always, that's always nice. But you see where the shipyard starts and where the buoy yard, which is over here, ends. And I know that because you do have a tug here, but this is a, a earlier light ship, pre-1913. And I can say that because it uh, looks to be a wooden type of uh, schooner vessel. And at that time, the standards were to paint a, a large uh, square or rectangle in the middle of the ship, the mid portion white, and then you would paint your station name in black, or you would leave it blank, and so that your schooners were brown, they were wood, and you would see the name displayed that way. This looks like a coaling ship or an oil, almost like an oil ship, I believe, that was going toward or berthed right at the shipyard. So I, for, for me, this is, and I'm, I'm a history geek, as we all know, I'm right? sure. And you wouldn't be here if you didn't like a little bit of history. Uh, so for me, this is fascinating because it really is a culmination of our mission statement here at the museum with researching, preserving, and promoting the history of the city of Portsmouth, the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, and the Armed Forces in Hampton Roads. We talk about the city and the shipyard, Norfolk Naval Shipyard. That's what we do. The light ship service is a different mission statement, but to me, this is kind of a combination of the two, where you have really the two historical situations coming together and I'll do you one even better. We even have, we've even had dry dock log books at one time that uh, show where light ships were dry docked at Norfolk Naval. So again, for me, it's thrilling. So here's another photograph outside of the, uh, of the buoy yard. <coughs> this is light vessel 46. Now this was a little bit different. It had its letters on the, uh, on the side here actually on the hull itself. It may have been painted red, it's hard to tell, it's black and white. But it was Tail of Horseshoe, which was a station farther up the, uh, toward Yorktown, where Yorktown is today. Um, it was actually called Tail of Horseshoe, but the, after 1913, they had to, they had to um, shorten the names on light ships uh, in order to make them more effective, more efficient. So that's what they did. And it wasn't until I had help from a dear colleague of mine who helped me identify the building here and confirm that that is the building on the very edge of Norfolk Naval Shipyard. Thank you, Mark. Another pull from the crowd. So here you have Norfolk Naval Shipyard here. You have a light ship berth just outside and over this way, of course, is your buoy yard uh, and, and where uh, other light ships were likely, you know, berthed at that time. So here's another image, and at some, at some point I just started saying, you know, it's a great image. Let me just put that in the slideshow. It doesn't have a lot of narration, but it really makes for, in my, my opinion, an, a nice appeal. Here you're looking from Norfolk Naval coming this way, and uh, they're actually doing work on the seawall construction at this time. You can see in 1915, I believe that is. And here you see a light ship in the, uh, in the background here. Here's its bell. Here are its light masts, and again, it's, um, it might even be slightly over to the shipyard's territory, for lack of a better term. But, um, but in essence, you know, it was right butted up against the shipyard. Uh, so these two institutions, high industry just happening all the time, turn of the century. You know, you've got a lot of resources here in Portsmouth with the shipyard. You have the buoy depot, and this buoy, de buoy depot was supp supplying buoys and servicing light ships for the entire 5th District, which stretched from Maryland all the way down to not quite into South Carolina, I believe. A lot of work. And we had the main buoy depot um, in the 5th District. Portsmouth was it. Here's another one. Again, looking from Norfolk Naval, here's that building again right over this way. And, and this definitely is intruding onto shipyard territory, you might say, along the, uh, along the uh, wharf here. This is interesting because this is LV-71, which um, we also talk about specifically in the exhibit over this way. It served on the Diamond Shoal Station, which was off the North Carolina coast, not too far. It served as the Diamond, that was its name, and later it served as a relief ship. In 1917, this, this light ship was actually sunk while on station by a German U-boat, which again is discussed in the exhibit. It should, this view shows the light ship even further again into the yard. And um, <clears throat> I believe uh, 
Again, a good marker that I've used before is Building 51. That's the name of this building that you see here. So it's just fascinating that this ship, you see it here, fairly healthy, it's here. It's not on station right now, later on. It, um, at least the, the, German, uh, the crew of the German U-boat uh, hailed them and allowed them to get off the ship before they destroyed it. So that was nice of them, which wasn't uncommon actually at that time. Okay, I said earlier that we, there's never actually been a Portsmouth station. Again, good marketing on our part. However, the closest you could come to an actual light ship outside of it going to the buoy depot, an actual light ship on the Elizabeth River would be the Bush. The Bush light ship, actually named for, originally for more of a, more Bausch or Bush, but spelled with a, spelled with an O here for Bausch Bluff, which has a history all of its own um, in Norfolk. Essentially, that station was just off of where, roughly where Norfolk Naval Base is today. Uh, and so this was one of the only ships outside of the Craney Island one uh, and the Willoughby Spit one really early on in 1820. This one was, was the one that served on the, the Elizabeth River for the longest period of time, which was um, a span from about 1893 to 1919, I believe it was. Incidentally, this this was the um, this particular light ship was the first ever first light ship ever to actually be electrically powered for illumination, and that was in 1913. So then we transitioned from the 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 buoy yard after 1939. At once, it, the lighthouse service becomes part of the. Uh, the United States Coast Guard, the Coast Guard take over this facility and it becomes part of the larger facility that eventually is called the, uh, the Berkeley Station, so, called such because Berkeley and Norfolk, there was a segment, there was a portion of the base over in Norfolk and right across the river, again, right down by the Intellos on the other side. I've spent a lot of time walking down there recently, just kind of historically imagining things and getting a good walk in. Uh, none of that's there today, of course. Now it's... Um, uh, I always forget the name, Ocean Marina. It's the marina that works on vessels and such. But uh, this was the scene at the time, circa 1939 or 45, I believe it was. And so um, we have a few scenes, different angles here. That's a little closer scene. They have everything from every kind of boat you can imagine. They have buoys here. Again, this is you know, the, the old buoy yard upgraded, post 39, part of the, the, the Coast Guard, you see, you see a small cutter it appears to be over here, other smaller boats, and hey, there's a light ship. It's actually a relief ship. So it wasn't uncommon, again, even post 1939, around the time Mr. Kirby that I was speaking about earlier, he was running around as a kid, or actually he was getting ready to go off to war at this point. Light ships weren't a common sight for him and others at that time coming up and down the river. So um, later on, why not bring a light ship to Portsmouth, you know, and put it on display? Here's another scene. Again, they're making a lot of use out of this slip here, all kind of boats in there. And I believe this street is what divides the shipyard, if I'm not mistaken, over this way. And this is a portion of the, uh, of the, uh, the Berkeley Station. Here's a bigger scene. Or from another angle that you can get a better sense of things. The Norfolk side of the Berkeley stations over this way. You're looking from inside Portsmouth, looking down, and you get a sense of, of uh, the, the area that they used. Um, right over here, for instance, this is roughly right in this area that you don't see. This is where the old seaboard building right across the way would be. So it's kind of out of frame here. But from a slightly different angle, I apologize to get a better, more modern sense of what we're looking at today. And actually, part of the footprint still remains right here. This appears to be one of the uh, jetty, for lack of a better term, that, that's, that's still um, kind of distinguishable from you know, when it was part of the, of the Coast Guard. Everything is here still as well, but it looks like they filled in with a marine railway here and the shipyard is roughly right over this way. So this is the scene today. Here's the Intellos, where a lot of great con concerts happen. Uh, I'll defer to them on the marketing portion and all the concerts coming this summer. 
However, um, we're not too far up the way right up this way. So, so again, <clears throat> why is there a light ship in Portsmouth? Back to the question. So, <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of trouble to go through. I mean, why go through all the trouble to have a light ship, as our exhibit will tell you, to go and have a light ship towed by uh, Captain Pinello and his group, who collaborated with uh, Frank Kirby, um, to actually tow the light ship back here at Portsmouth. It wasn't cheap to do. It, it risked lives aboard the vessel towing. It was a, this was a fishing vessel, after all. So therefore, um, it wasn't really accustomed to towing a steel ship behind it, like of this size. So there was some danger involved. But you know, there was also cost. You know, and why go through the trouble of having a light ship towed here? Again, it cost. Why go through the trouble to find a plot of land, or specifically a slip just down the way, and dedicate this piece of valuable waterfront real estate to a little red ship? And here we see the efforts to bring the light ship into the slip that once served as a slip and wharf for the old Seaboard Airline Railroad. So this was a valuable piece of real estate. You know why? Why put a ship here? Why oh, this little ship? It's not a battleship. You know, it's. Uh, I mean, it, it it certainly has its its wonderful history. But you know, you could you could do a lot with that with that property. And then, why go through the trouble to fill the slip in with concrete around the ship? Okay, it it was the best way at the time to preserve the ship. I understand that, but but that's a lot of concrete. I mean, you know, concrete wasn't cheap, still isn't. So, you know, why go through all that trouble? And why is there a horse in this in this slide? <laughs> anyway, irrelevant, <laughs> but a fun a fun photo. So again, why is there a light ship in Portsmouth, Virginia? Well, in 1820, it was the first light ship. The first light ship in the U.S. was stationed off of Crane Island in Portsmouth, Virginia. 1870, the Lighthouse Service Buoy Depot Yard was established in Portsmouth, Virginia and continued uh, through, not from 1939 to 1971, that same buoy depot is annexed to the U.S. Coast Guard Station at Berkeley. That's 101 years. Incidentally, the same length of our ship and the LV number of our ship but no numerology this evening. I'm just saying, one on one. It's an interesting, interesting number that kind of comes, comes forward. All this taken into consideration, my question, um, you know, why is there a light ship in Portsmouth? Really looking at all of this, soaking it all in, looking at these points, I start asking, you know, why shouldn't there be a light ship in Portsmouth, Virginia? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. Any, if you have any questions. And what I'm going to do too is while we partake of the victuals here in the back, please do, by the way. Our, our friends go through, go through a lot of, uh, I won't say trouble, I, but they go through a, a lot to put this out for us. So please feel free to leave that table empty when you leave this evening if you can. I plan to. While we're doing that, what I'm going to do because I could go on and on all night. We could do that if you want to stick around. Okay, well, we won't do that. I will keep a PowerPoint that I have on our specific light ship going so that you can see some, uh, some of its scenes throughout its history and uh, it'll just keep revolving over and over so you can enjoy that while you talk. Again, have some refreshments, things of that nature. So, is, any questions? Is the man's bucket in Rhode Island? It's out of Massachusetts. It's out of Massachusetts. Right. It's actually in Boston. <laughs> the ship itself. Nantucket, the area is in the Nantucket Sound near in Massachusetts. The but ship is a museum in Boston now. The old, the 112. The new ones that, that finished up up there, one of them is a, a cruise boat. I put two and a half million dollars into it and it takes out cruises. And the other one kind of moves around from town to town. They can't seem to find a permanent place. Yeah. 
Is that one I wrote on? It might be that one. Okay. The kind of movie. It was in uh, a born about a born bridge in the uh, Cape Cod Canal. Uh -huh. It was there for a while and then moved to New York and then back up the road and moves around. But the, the old one, the one I was on, is in Boston and it's a museum now. There's been a few man socket light ships that have been turned into other things, including a museum. One that was gutted essentially, the outside's still the same, but it's a luxury yacht that you can rent. And then there was an additional one, I believe, that was part of the Intrepid Museum <coughs> for years. That was man That was yeah, the one that we awesome. that you're involved with now. Okay. So there's been there's been a number of those. Any other questions? Just yes, curious How bright is it? How bright is the light? I mean, was it also from the from the from the very beginning, was it the brightness is just the same as what we have right now? Well, as technology's gotten better, um, it's, it's definitely gotten brighter. Originally, whale oil was used a lot um, for, for lighting on ships in general and for light ships. And then they, would start, they started using kerosene um, around the turn of the century, and then that kind of continued through. Then there was the acetylene gas. So I think it got brighter, and the efforts were to make it brighter with each step that they took to make it, to make it you know, very basic. They wanted to, to improve with the technologies. So by the time you have electric, you chose how bright it was by the, the wattage that you would put in. But I'm sure there were limitations to that as well. How, how bright did you find in your well, experience? Yeah, the one I was on had a bank of sealed beam headlights, like in your car, the old sealed beam headlights. And it was about six across and four down. And so it was, how, do you think how long it would reach now? It, it wow. was, it, in clear weather, it was supposed to reach over the horizon, you know, as far as the horizon, which 15, 20 miles, with, with being that high. It was about 80 feet up in the air. And when those balls burned out, you had to climb the mast and put, replace the balls. So when there's a fog, it's a typhoon. I mean, when it's foggy, you can't see anything, you, you got a horn. Yeah, but then the, 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 the lighthouse won't, won't work, and then you have to climb the mast. It's useless. You couldn't see the light. But, you can't see the light. And you had the horn, you had the radio beacon, which ships monitor that. If they didn't home in on it, but on Nantucket Shoals, I was out there three weeks, never saw anything. Solid fall, wind blows 60, 70 mile an hour. Solid fall. You just hope that your charts were accurate, that their charts on the other ships were accurate. They monitored that beacon again, another technological step where the beacon was constantly going, which we're pretty accustomed to with navigation today. And then you you had that beacon of sound again fog bells yeah the, the fog horns and and the lightship sailors association which are a grouping of, of sailors who are retired now they actually um uh got i believe got legislation passed not too far back 10 percent disability 10 percent disability 10 percent just for serving on a lightship for hearing for hearing i mean you couldn't go outside so my tinnitus actually pales in comparison it i'm sure very with this. loud horn i mean it, it was air air diaphone and it was and you could hear it, again, if it wasn't any fog, you could hear it a long way. But when it was foggy, when I came in on the buoy tender to read the other crew one time, we got about a thousand yards before we could hear the horn. So do you keep a maintenance of it? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. It was a full-time job. There was always something going on, especially out on outer Nantucket. That was... Up to now, correct. Right. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, it was something. They got a buoy out there now. but. It, uh, Plus, when I was on there, I got torpedoed by a submarine. <laughs> submarine uses for target practice. His with dummy torpedo in there. But the Navy wouldn't admit that, would they? <laughs> well, they never would admit to it, but they were concerned. It was a training sub out of New London. You know? It's just national security. And they couldn't uh, talk to the sub when it was submerged. Okay. And it was underwater for half the day, and it finally came up, and they come back and told the Coast Guard that there had been no light ships in the area and the light ship would, we got a number off the sub the day before that the guy thought he got a number, he wasn't sure of it. But they come back and said that that submarine was scrapped in 1950. So the Coast Guard went back and told the Navy, keep them submarines away from the light ship, even the ghost submarines. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing, I'll, I'll add somewhat to that. You see in this ship, uh, this picture here, how bright the ship is, well that was standard for light ships except for Great Lakes White Lightships, which were black. That was the difference. Um, and again, in this daytime, you're not going to see that light, with compared to the ambient sunlight, you're not going to see it as brightly. 
So they painted these bright red, the same reason they paint Bodie Island Lighthouse with stripes. Uh, no, excuse me, with the, the it was Hatteras. That, you know how lighthouses have those interesting patterns. They too serve as day marks, so that you don't see the light quite as well, but darn if you can't see the bright red light ships at the time, or even to the modern lighthouses of today with all these, these wacky designs, or these, these very aesthetically pleasing designs, if you will. So that's how, you know, at, at night is when they really shine, no pun intended, or pun intended. But um, in the daytime, to help with that, you would see these, they would really stand out from, from the, uh, the shoreline, whether it was light ships or lighthouses, too. Yeah, it was question. a crazy job. It was, it was interesting. When I first went on there, the first thing I was going to do was write a letter and get rid of this thing. Yeah. <laughs> but all the captains on the ships uh, and the big cruise liners, the Queen Elizabeth II, the all of them, they, they, when they come alongside, if it was nighttime, they would turn all their deck lights on, and I'd do the same thing. And we would communicate with postcards. They would send me a postcard from the captain back and forth, and they'd make a big announcement. That was the first thing they saw coming into the United States. It was actually marking the channel going into New York. All the ships coming from Newark. It was, it was a little bit important. Very important. Uh, Later, light ships were, were um, replaced with large navigational buoys that we still use today. Um, so it was safer on the crew. I think, of it, I think of it in terms of sometimes of downsizing on light ships. So you don't have as much personnel at risk, which is the good thing. So it's not that the, the negative type of downsizing we're also familiar with, but you actually um, are letting machines do the work so that you're preserving human life with, with the more that, again, the technology increases. And so you don't have like, You know, like the duty, because you got two weeks on and two weeks off in the summer. In the wintertime, it was three weeks off. And we had to take the ship into Boston and relieve them out. In the winter, you couldn't have crew change. It was so rough. But most of them liked it. You know, I had a cook on there who couldn't make jello. <laughs> I got in a hurry. <laughs> how, how big was it for? Had 20 men, 21 men count me, and you had 10 on and 10 off. Mm -hmm. And most of the time they worked that way, and they were supposed to take leave, but I, I worked a compensatory leave around because we were out there so much in the winter that uh, everybody left there with 30 day leave on the books. Because it was such a rough station. All right. Any other questions, folks? And, and I'm not going anywhere right now. So if you have any other questions, and, and there's Pete here, because I, I certainly, Peter knows um, uh, that uh, I pick his brain every, every opportunity I get. He's one of our wonderful volunteers, an example of, of the, the awesome volunteer base that we have. And so uh, if it strikes you to volunteer for, for the museums and you have the time, there's a nice lead into volunteerism right there, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Feel free to give us a call here at the museum. So, and thank you for uh, coming out. I'd like to thank Corey for giving us a little bit of more insight into our local history. Uh, the day they brought the light ship in, it was uh, nor'easter. Oh, yes. And, and uh, Mr. Kirby and Mr. Phelps, Harry Phelps, met the uh, light ship here and tied it up and kept it secure until they could put it in all of that cement. <laughs> so come back, enjoy the museum while you're here, and come back and visit again. Thank you. Thank you.